Hello and welcome to the Kearley Cultivation Podcast. I'm your host, Dexter Kearley, and this episode is titled, Should You Prepare? I kind of went through a uh, bunch of different um, titles, possible titles for this episode. Uh, I kind of settled on, Should You Prepare? Because, well, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, One was because we don't really talk a whole lot about actually preparing in this episode. It's kind of one of the things where, I mean, I, we are not currently like super prepared in, in our life style or stage at the moment. So we, we still have a long way to go. But uh, one of the reasons that we made our lifestyle switch, which we moved from Amarillo, I was on the fire department there, and then we kind of sold everything and moved out to to the farm. And one of the big uh, prompts, one of the things that prompted us was COVID and the COVID shutdown and you know, I always, the, the, one of the main things that I cite, and this is one of the things that I just realized that society was completely out of control was whenever they, they caution taped off the playgrounds. Um, you know, one, there was a playground across the street from Mm -hmm. us and we would go over there and at most there was like one or other, one or two other kids there when we went. I mean, uh, typically there was nobody there. And the fact that they, you know, cord- uh, quartered it off. And I mean, it was just such a ridiculous time. Um, but I titled it, Should You Prepare? Because I do think that it is a process of preparing. And one of the first Uh, things is you have to have that impetus you have to have a reason that you're deciding that hey you know what now I'm going to prepare now I'm gonna I'm gonna take that next step so um this episode is a little on the doomy side um I don't it's hard because I have these huge ways personally in my in my mindset and and there are times where I think I'm super optimistic. I don't think anything uh, super cataclysmic is going to happen. And if something cataclysmic did happen, I think, well, you know what? We'll be fine. We'll, we'll be able to make it through. Um, then there's then there's other times wherever, you know, uh, ironically, the night after we recorded this episode, a storm blew through our area. And a branch just up the road. I mean, I'm not talking maybe half a mile up the road. Big tree split in half. And the half of the tree knocked out the power to our house. And I just thought it was so ironic because here we are doing an episode over being prepared, which it wasn't really, it's more of a, of a, why should we prepare or should we prepare kind of episode? Uh, but then we were out of power. And so I was like, how ironic is it that the, literally the evening of our recording that we were unprepared in a pretty significant way. Now, granted, it wasn't that big of a deal because I think the power, I mean, we all just went to bed and the power was on whenever I got up, you know, to go to the bathroom or whatever at like, midnight so it wasn't that big of a deal but you know if power went off it was it was a little bit of a of an eye-opener because you know a lot of these scenarios you know if you think like the walking dead or you think these different apocalyptic shows you always think like man I, i would be okay i would be able to make it and even something as simple as man if the power goes off I'll be okay. I mean, it's just, who needs the power? We don't need the power that much, you know? It's, it's you know, but when it's completely dark in the house and everybody's walking around with headlamps and you've got your little lanterns out and stuff and there no water is coming out of the sink, it really does get you thinking like, man, we really probably uh, have been uh, lulled 
by postmodernity into this ease of life and uh, a, a general state of unpreparedness. Um, and then another thing, I think we kind of talk about it a little bit in this episode, but I wanted to go ahead and throw it out here at the beginning is even if the world doesn't end, a type of world is ending. Uh, I think we've seen it with COVID. We've seen supply chains get disrupted. Uh, this this world of ease, maybe. I'm not exactly sure. Consistency, reliability, maybe. Uh, I, I think, well, number one, I think to begin with, it's an illusion. I don't think nobody's as prepared as they think they are. Um, and even the, the institutions that we have in place aren't as prepared as you would think that they are. Uh, as we talk a little bit at the, at, at the end of this episode, I'm telling you, you got to stay for the last, till the last 30 minutes because Shannon and I get a little heated with each other. It was actually really fun to record and granted it's, you know, we, we, it made it into the recording, but that's 95% of our conversations are a little bit more on the, uh, I make a strong proclamation that this is the way it is. And she usually is on the opposite side of it. So it's, it's kind of fun. Y'all need to make sure that you make it to that end. But even if the world doesn't end, we should be transitioning towards a more decentralized lifestyle. And I think that that's, underpinning what we're talking about you know i uh although i think if you have the means to do like an underground bunker with food storage and everything like that do it i mean why not that'd be awesome and also it would be super useful like even as as we're expanding the garden and and growing stuff one of the things that you think about you start to realize is like where am i going to store all this like if i did create a surplus from one year to the next year like was standard for people 200 years ago, right? You would you would say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to make my potatoes, but I'm going to have my potatoes to where they last me the entire winter. Uh, do I? We don't currently have a spot to store those. You need a dark and cool, well, air circulate. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into just basic survival stuff, even if the world wasn't ending. Um, but... I just wanted to throw out a strong disclaimer that we are not prepared. We are still very dependent on the system. We are still very tied to the system. This is not uh, meant to be like um, an instructional uh, podcast. We were thinking about maybe possibly doing a more instructional podcast, uh, if not for ourselves, you know. Uh, Mostly, it is kind of one of those things like how do you... Is there, now there's a ton of content just on the internet over this of like making lists and like how are we going to prepare. And so um, uh, another quick episode note is I screwed up the recording. Uh, I was hesitant. Uh, the, The board was a little messed up. And whenever we go periods of time in between recording... I forget stuff and stuff slips my mind. And in the moment, I even say it in this episode, like, ah, oh, I think I maybe have messed something up here, but let's just go with it, whatever. What I did was I set the pan on my board to left for me and right for Shannon. So now, whenever you're listening to this, I'm going to be in one headphone and Shannon's going to be in the other headphone. If you're listening through like a computer or an external speaker, like a Bluetooth speaker, it probably won't be that annoying. If you're listening to it through a headset, it's going to be a little bit more annoying. I kind of hate it whenever episodes do this, but I couldn't figure out since I since the data that came in, it recorded it into one uh, audio file. And in that audio file, it's it's screwed up. I, I couldn't figure out. I mean, I'm sure that there is a way to switch it to where it's good to go. I just, I don't know how to do that. And I listened to a portion of the episode with my headphones on. And it really wasn't terribly annoying. Like, I've, I've had episodes and people before where 
only the sound is coming out of one ear or the other, and that is super annoying. And so I'm hoping that this won't be too annoying. I I did not want to attempt to re-record this episode because I actually felt like it was it's a good episode. Like there are sometimes whenever our, we go through a recording, and at the end of the recording, I'm like, ugh. I didn't really say what I wanted to say, or I didn't really get the point to where we we got to, or Shannon and I are just like button heads the whole time, and I'm, I'm just, I don't feel like it's a great recording, but this one, at the end of the recording, I was like, dang, that's exactly the episode that I was shooting for, that I was wanting to get, so... I'm sorry if it is super annoying or if it's a, uh, you know, not a great recording. I am learning. I'm not good at this stuff yet. You know, I'm, I'm still, uh, even whenever I get good at it, by the time I record another episode, I'm bad at it again. So, you know, not, it is what it is. Um, however, I did enjoy this episode and hopefully we'll be back on a recording schedule. We'll start putting out episodes. We just got super busy there for a little while. We put new windows throughout the whole house. I've been working on projects, uh, finishing up some bath, a bathroom and then working on the garden and then weed eating and just, you know, nobody wants to hear me complain about, uh, how busy I am, but we are, I think we're getting to a point to where we're going to be able to start being a lot more consistent and uh, hopefully y'all can reach out. This episode, I do feel like we'll have some comments or people will want to comment. I would encourage you if you're, no matter where you're listening at, uh, to hop over either on uh, like my Facebook uh, post of it, uh, more, I would really encourage you to hop on YouTube. Since I'm starting to put these episodes up on YouTube now, uh, hop on there and throw a comment or in in the chat on on YouTube. I think that would be and a like that would be nice. But I'm trying to figure out how to create exposure and get a little bit more eyeballs or ears on this podcast. I I would love to take this medium. You know, I've been now doing it for a long time, longer than I'd like to admit. It's like a little embarrassing that I'm not further along than I am. But I'd really like to take this platform to a, a different level, uh, you know, a higher level or whatever you'd want to call it. So uh, if you could hop on to YouTube, just check out the Curly Cultivation podcast and uh, hit me a li- hit a like or what I'm really interested in, more interested in is leave a comment and say whether you are already preparing, whether some of this information is new for you, and also what do you think is the most likely scenario. But you know, you can you can really spin your wheels a lot preparing for like a hypothetical situation that has a very low likelihood of actually happening versus a scenario that has a very high likelihood of happening. Like it was actually kind of funny because I've been getting some certain stuff in order and trying to get a little bit more prepared. Nothing crazy. We haven't done anything crazy other than moving out to the farm and buying a double wide. But uh, Shannon, it was really funny the other day we were talking about preparedness or I was saying something like, man, I really need to figure out our power situation. Like if, because that's that was one of my themes for 2024 is like lights out 2024 like some i feel like something might kick off to where the power is going to be disrupted and that's a big deal i mean if you don't have a sustainable reproducible power source you're going to be in trouble so i was kind of curious about that and you know i was just spitball and stuff off of shane and i was like well you know do we need uh, like <clears throat> a, an electric generator that runs off of gas, but also off of a gasifier. So do I need to build a gasifier? If you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, and do I need a solar panel with an independent battery bank for the well? And I mean, I was going through all this stuff. And she, you know, stopped me and said, uh, can you just help me with the laundry? You know? Um, can you just help me 
get the kids' lunches ready for in the morning. And I thought that that was so interesting because I was like, you know, how how easy is it to be so focused on the future and the cataclysm, like the cataclysm, the apocalypse, the, you know, that instance um, that you forget about like the day-to-day stuff that life is actually about, you know? So... I, I thought that this was going to be a pretty fun topic. It was. I don't exactly know what our next topic is going to be, if it's going to be in this vein. I am very interested in the philosophical implications of doomsday mindsets. I think that that's a lot of fun. So uh, like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Uh, leave a comment. I want to I wanna hear what y'all think about all this stuff and you know what are you doing to prepare or do you feel like you're already prepared or like one of the common things that I've heard a lot of people say recently is if something like that happens I'm just gonna go out in the street and let them kill me I'm like wait what I mean like uh who are you assuming is gonna kill you like you know you almost want to like dig in and be like well what is your scenario what is your you know because Uh, let's just say like the power goes out and you're like, well, okay, uh, they're going to go kill me. You know, I don't know. So interesting stuff. A lot of stuff is, uh, it's fun to talk about. So please check out this episode and stay till the end. Thank you. So, hello. Are we starting? I think we're starting. Okay. So, had a uh, slight technical difficulties, as always. As always. Uh, as you can see, we've kind of rearranged. The, I don't know. I guess you'd have to have seen previous recordings. We rearranged. To know that we rearranged, but sorry for the white out. It's a little cloudy in the outside, but you can kind of see. This is uh, part of the reason we haven't been doing a whole lot of new episodes. Is Do we want to close the window or leave it open? I think it's all right. Okay. I don't think it'll hurt anything. You can hear the birds. I know. It's kind of nice. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure what I'm calling this episode yet. I had a couple of different ideas. One was like I'm coming out as like a uh, as a Cassandra, so to speak. It's like a chicken little, you know, like the sky's falling. You know uh, Cassandra? No. You know, here, look up that term real quick. Uh, a Cassandra. Oh, yeah. I don't, I've, I've never heard of that. Um. And so I'm not exactly sure, but the uh, overall idea of the episode is, uh, you know, to go back to what the episode one of the Kirli Cultivation, I opened it with. Are you talking about Greek mythology? Yeah. Okay. Um, I opened it with the phrase, welcome to the sinking ship that is post-modernity, which, you know, I guess is kind of loaded in its own way. Uh, but. You know, since really I've always had this feeling like it's all coming to an end. That's part of the reason that Fight Club was one of my favorite movies is it's just this almost like let's lean into the depravity and the destruction of a culture. But the point of the book was that that was equally as destructive. I don't think that there's – I mean, I do think that there is a constructive side to destruction, but there is the destruction. I just didn't want to overlook that. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, real quick, Cassandra was – or if you're calling someone a Cassandra nowadays, you're referring to a person who has valid warnings or concerns, but they are disbelieved by others. Mm. Almost the perfect term for it i don't know should we close that so, you think it's catching a little too much there's just going to be a lot of background noise which i don't necessarily know is bad but that's up to you so in greek mythology cassandra was the daughter of priam the king of troy apollo was struck by her beauty so he gave her the gift of prophecy on the condition that she agreed to marry him mm. um 
Cassandra refused, so she so he placed a curse on her, which is that she does have the gift of prophecy, but nobody would believe her. Ooh. So that's what it comes from. So I'm not necessarily saying that I was blessed by a god. <laughs> You're a Cassandra. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I do feel like there are elements of our society, you know, I think you go all the way go into the 90s probably, pre-internet or pre-World Wide Web, pre-common adoption of the internet, and see these cracks in these like, you know, the neocon – military industrial complex all of these different elements that will maybe morph into something different you know but it is an apocalypse of the idea of what america was i feel like uh in in several different ways but the other so the the basic idea of today's episode is i'm going to try to convince everybody that the world is ending uh, in the first part And so the big question is, does it end with a whimper or with a scream? Is it a sudden snap where everything's gone or is it, is it an overall whimper? I thought it was interesting because, uh, I don't know if everybody is familiar with this term or not, but predictive programming, do you want to look that up real quick for us as well? Cause I don't actually know the exact definition of predictive programming. Uh, But I I feel like it's something along the lines of like pop culture that is used to um, basically like almost like soft disclosure. Like it's it's going to give us uh, try to try to help us go through the next oncoming event, whatever the next event is. Uh, as she's looking that up, I'll give a few examples of ones that have kind of gotten me worried recently. If y'all have uh, seen the uh, TV show, which was based off of the book series by Isaac Asimov called Foundation, there's a scene in it where he is, uh, the emperor is, he doesn't like what one of the, uh, one of the planets has done. So he decides to uh, kill half the inhabitants, and the way they do that is they bring in these huge spaceships that just launch nuclear bombs at the whole planet and basically blow up half of the planet, uh, surface-wise. Do you have a definition? Yeah, it's not the most concise definition. Or Do you want to finish what you're saying first? No, go ahead. Okay. So basically, predictive programming is when the government or other higher authorities – Use films and books to increase public acceptance of planned future events. So basically, the idea behind it is that the government is trying to manipulate citizens and enable them to predict what they want in the future. So, this is not just to create a social change. It's not to actually do something. It's simply uh, often used to control the impact of something. So it's not necessarily saying we're going to blow up the entire planet, but if the entire planet gets blown up, here's Here's how how we want you to to frame it. Here's how we may, or maybe not so surprised by it. Maybe you've already seen this play out in movies, so you have an idea of what to expect or how you should act, how you should feel about it. That's more what it's about, not that it's actually controlling specific events. Okay. So, some, so foundation. When yes. he, when it, and then Dune recently, um, I, I'm speaking more towards Dune part one cause I haven't seen Dune part two. I haven't seen either. So I can't help you here. But there's this scene where the bad guys, the Harkonnens are coming in and house of treaties is in this big village, big town. And the Harkonnens come in and they've got these ships that are way up in the spe- in, in the sky and they start, start shooting these like sidewinding missiles that just strike all over the place and they blow up a ton of stuff. And it's just this raining destruction from the sky, basically. And then there's also another clip in, uh, it's called rebel moon. It's Zack Snyder's basically star Wars, uh, which has some other interesting things that I won't get into at the moment, but it also has this, sky born bombing campaign of these like futuristic ships that can just blow up a whole bunch of stuff. 
So those are three things that I hope are not predictive programming, uh, but that are consistent across several different, you know, storylines. And then, of course, you have movies like Independence Day and Arrival and all these different uh, playing up the whole alien trope of that's that there's these other civilizations with these other capacities. You know, the first three examples were humans doing it to humans. Then there's a bunch of movies where it's aliens doing it to humans, like Independence Day is a, a really good example of that. And then there's uh, a bunch of disaster movies like Deep Impact, Armageddon, The Day After Tomorrow, where it's these more, uh, you know, the, the, you know, cosmic impact slash weather events that happen. And then, of course, there's the whole zombie trope of like Walking Dead and uh, the last kid on Earth is that the one that Emmett's been watching? Yeah, I think that's what you it's know. Called. It's like a zombie kid movie. It's kind of fun. Uh, anyway, those are all like things that are have been coming out consistently for since cinema has existed. And if they are predictive programming, it kind of makes you wonder what are they preparing us for, or you know, priming the tank for. Do you have a thought about that? I do. I'm not opposed to the idea of predictive programming. I think that that is valid, and I'm sure to some extent does happen. At the same time, I also think of like children's literature, which is often a lot darker than people expect. Because children are figuring out how to feel about things. So, they learn about their kids losing moms or they talk about death they talk about being on their own they talk about survival i mean i remember reading hatchet you know that was a very popular one and then i remember one i can't even remember the name of it now but it's basically about a robot takeover and i mean it's this is like for elementary school kids and then you look at most roll doll books also which aren't always happy like the witches was one of my favorite books as a kid where the boy is scared of these witches who are trying to eat children. But again, that's considered good for children to read because it's a safe place for them to play out these emotions. Because as a child, they're learning about fear and anxiety and worry and disappointment and frustration, but they don't know how to do these things. They, they don't know what they are. And so it's not always something that you can practice in everyday life because... One, there may not be a safe place to do it, depending on who your parents are, or your school is, or whatnot. And two, you may not be able to practice dealing with death if you don't have a death close to you. So books and TV shows can give you a place to learn those things. So I sometimes wonder if just as a society, we get these books and TV shows and movies just as a way for us to deal with our own societal anxieties in a safe way. And I, I mean, fair enough. There, that is a possibility. And they could both be true. I think the thing that is interesting to me is the the tropes that transcend, right? So, you know, you got Hatchet where it's a guy gets, you know, whatever. It's, Has to be alone and take care of himself. Yeah, and, there, and then one of the really great examples is um, Philip K. Dick. I feel like a lot of his books are unique and interesting. And... Um, to me, seem very genuinely produced and crafted, right? But then you have, um, you have these other things where it's like Armageddon and Deep Impact, both came out the exact same year from two major studios, and they had almost the exact same storyline and plot. And with just the known capture of those organizations by organizations like the CIA and the FBI always has me a little concerned. I get that. I think I think there's room in there for both. I personally think the majority of it is my understanding of it, of just us playing out societal anxieties. But I think that the predictive programming comes into play. Fair enough. Maybe like 80-20. 80-20. That'd that, be my, my thought. That sounds right. Um, and then, so... Man, I'm, I'm actually kind of worried that I might have messed up the audio. 
Do you want to go back and listen to it to double check? Um. Yeah, we're not too far into well, it. Well, we can always just come back right here. You know what I mean? I don't know if I can just pause. Oh, I can. Pause it. Well, do you want to go double check it real quick? We no, can always we'll go cut with this it. out, right? We'll go yeah. with it. We're good. We're just going to go with it. See, because I, I set the pans, but I remember I did that last time. I set the pans. I think we're fine. We're just going to go with it. You I'll, don't go I, can, I can fix it post. I don't know how I would even check it. Okay. Fine. Fine. So Let's do it. We're just going to go with it. Um, so my case for the doomsday mindset, um, a few his- historical examples was Sherman's March in the Civil War where you had one side that basically won the war and the other side uh, had lost, and they decided, you know what? Let's just go through the South and burn everything. Let's destroy everything that they have, and then we'll just restart it anew afterwards, right? It's easier just to, you know, scorched earth, basically. We'll just burn everything, and then we can reinstate our um, ideology. And, you know, that... That example of the Civil War has uh, a lot of possible implications in today's state because, I mean, I almost can't turn on a media source without hearing a reference to the oncoming, the up-and-coming Civil War. Yeah, like this growing divide. And so uh, a good uh, fictional example of that is Gone with the Wind, right? Yeah, well— Yes, fictional Although she, story, but with the real. I mean, it is right. based on the real. Events. And so she survives it. Yeah. But, I mean, apocalypse, right? And then uh, the Dust Bowl, the Grapes of Wrath. That's what I was going to say is I think the Grapes of Wrath, well, there are two books that come to mind, Grapes of Wrath being one and Blood Meridian being another one. But speaking of the Dust Bowl specifically, the Grapes of, Bath, Grapes of Wrath is one of those books that when people talk about like how bad our society is currently – like, no, no, no. Here, read this book. Come back to me. Like, it can get worse. Well, and It can get much worse. What's interesting about that was it was a corporate um, – it was a corporate apocalypse. What happened was these people had taken out loans to buy seeds for their next crop. The crop didn't make. Now they owe money on the seeds that they had bought which they use the bank's money for, and so there's no product. Well, as I mean, yes. And also with the people trying to move west, those people who were moving were being told there's good land to buy, there are plenty of jobs here, come west. Like, we want your money. And so they were flat out lying to these people. So that they could have a cheap labor pool. Yes. So that they could make then more money. Yes. Right? It was – it was all a ploy by, like, the corporate world yes. to completely just desecrate, yeah. you know, uh, an entire class of, of people, which were all share far, sharecroppers. What? Decimate? What did I say? Desecrate? Desecrate. Yeah, I guess they're not really They're a, slightly uh, different. Yeah. I was thinking about it in my head about which one's which, but I think that'd be yeah, decimate. Yeah, they're not an altar. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> Um, so those are two examples. Uh, of course, we have uh, the fall of Rome is the classic example that everybody uses. You've got uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, along with all of the fire bombings of World War II, which were literally like, hey, let's just see how efficiently and how many people we can murder. Um, and then we have, let's see here. These are all kind of examples of, of uh, civil collapse, right? It's it's not necessarily, like, it didn't have to go this way. There was an element of it that was civil. It was, like, created by men in men's minds that yeah. led to this collapse. In Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, he has a, I know I've talked about this a bunch, uh, or I talk about it a bunch, but he has a series called Wrath of the Cons. And... I've always loved that series, but one of the things that he talks about in that series is how the cons, or the cons, uh, Genghis Khan leading the Mongols, they could they would literally roll through an area and chop off everybody's heads and throw them up in this mound. And he has these historical accounts of people who are like kind of coming in the wake of this 
army that's moving through and they don't know about the army, right? So back then the communication lines weren't super well. So they would just roll up into this area and there would be blood soaked ground and a 60 foot high pile of human skulls just rotting. And they were like, what is this? Right. And nobody is left alive to tell or talk about it. Yeah. People don't understand. I mean, I say people, that's a vast, uh, general statement. I feel like many people overlook the horrible things that have happened and continue to happen. We're pretty safe. Oh yeah. Currently. Yeah. We're well, well, it's to me, what's interesting about it is there is a mechanism of destruction that we always think of, I mean, in my mind, we we go to like the foundation type destructive force. That's these futuristic spaceships that have these futuristic weapons. And we forget that there is historical examples of men with swords and pointy sticks. And they're able to murder millions of people. Well, and that's what's interesting when I was looking up prepping and just trying to see why many people prep, like looking into the psychology behind it. Um, There were several people who would say, I prep because I've read history books. The end. If I were ignorant to history, sure, maybe I would completely overlook things. But we have seen this. Like, these are not fictional stories. We have read real stories of atrocities oh yeah and yeah (laughs) it could happen again and it i mean it will someday i mean no matter what it will happen again i mean you know history does repeat itself sometimes it rhymes they you know they say history rhymes so um here's some natural things that have happened in our history that are pretty well documented that were cataclysmic cataclysms uh you of course have the the dinosaur extinction right um i like i was like the, well you know i mean it, it's hard because air quote dinosaur the, the difficult extinction. thing about that is it's so far back in the fossil record yeah um that's definitely something happened and, and we definitely have examples but i am very skeptical about uh the historical presentation about a lot of that stuff because it's so it's just the same thing with like which i mean i'll get here and probably get to here in a little bit of you know ancient civilizations resetting right there's a ton of examples um that our current mainstream narrative of history is um not correct or is predicated on false uh assumptions i mean no matter what we have records of dinosaur bones, and there are no dinosaurs that exist. So. We have we have evidence of large animals. Yes, that no longer that exist. were fossilized, that we do not have current analogs to. Yes, so there was something that did exist and no longer exists. So uh, a really good example. This is one that uh, really woke me up. Is the Younger Dryas catastrophe? This happened. Between 12,900 years ago and 11,700 years ago. It's called the Younger Dryas. It's like a, you know, it's between the, uh, well, we live in the Holocene, and right before it, it was the, you might look this up. It was the demarcation between the Holocene, which we currently live in, and the, I want to say Pleistocene, but that doesn't seem right. Anyway, um, it was marked by cataclysmic floods. And if you look into Randall Carlson, uh, he has a series called uh, Cosmographia, but he also went on the Joe Rogan podcast several times with Graham Hancock. I think his first time on the Joe Rogan podcast, he was talking about the channeled scablands. And there's evidence of, you know, huge, huge floods in North America that basically completely decimated the the landscape what was the previous the, the, i don't know how you say it. the pleistocene the pleistocene Ooh, yeah i was right pulled it out of memory um anyway it also is marked by a 400 foot rise in sea level 
And so we were coming out of the glacial maximum and it was a really steady increase in global temperatures. And then the Younger Dryas hit, which is marked by Pulse Water 1A, maybe. And basically, the, the temperature of the Earth was warming, and then it plunged for that period. And then, it's, then it spiked, and it continued on the same warming path. So there's still a lot of discussion around what caused that. But it is marked by some of these uh, measurable things, like the 400-foot rise in sea level. And then the uh, extinction of almost all North American megafauna. So this is the short-nosed bear, the woolly mammoth, saber-toothed tiger. Um, there was like some big-ass armadillos, some really big beavers and stuff. And all of them were gone. They were eliminated right at that, at that level. Uh, anything you want to say about the Younger Dryas catastrophe? Nope. So it's pretty well documented, and they think it was probably a cosmic impact. Cool. They think that there's a possibility that it was, uh, I think the thing I've heard the most, it's by the Comet Research Group. They, uh, they claim that it was probably a series of impacts on the North Atlantic ice sheet, uh, that probably came from the Torrid Meteor Stream, which we still pass through twice a year around October, and I can't remember when the other one, when we go through, we go through it twice. The other event that's very well documented is the Tunguska event. Do you know about this? No, I don't think so. So the Tunguska event was a three to five megaton explosion that happened in 1908, uh, the 30th of June, 1908, and it flattened 830 square miles of forest. You should look up some pictures of it just so uh, you can be... Uh, say the name again. Uh, Tunguska event. Just type in Tunguska event. It'll show pictures. Yeah. Let me just type that in real quick. It'll... You, you don't even have to... I, I'm terrible at spelling it, and I got close enough for it. Um, Tunguska? Tunguska. Okay. Tunguska. Tunguska. Okay. However you say it. Well, not Tunguska. Tunguska. Okay. I like that. Say it. Say it like that. Or write it like that. Um, and that was a, yeah, that was a three to five megaton explosion. And they are like 99.9% .9 sure that what it was was a high altitude. What? Oh, sorry. It's just kind of funny because it just is telling me about it. And so, yeah, it's pretty much saying... It's this three to five megaton explosion, flattened an estimated 80 million trees, over 830 square miles, and three people may have died. It just is like, what? So, it just feels kind of anticlimactic compared to like how big it so was. So the reason know? that maybe three people died was it was in the middle of Siberia. It was in one of the most vast areas of land on the planet and most sparsely um most sparsely populated and so if that let's say that rock had have been you know a little bit later or a little bit earlier and it had blown up over europe we would we would still be that would that would have completely rewritten human history at that point because it was such a large event it was such yeah. a large but it it happened in the middle of nowhere they don't really have any pictures i mean like you can see pictures of just trees being flattened, yeah the trees being flat but that's really the only picture you can find yeah which because it, it was in 1908 yeah and the guys who stumbled upon it were like what the heck is this i think they were looking for it i think they went out there looking for it but you know nobody i mean nobody knew what what had happened or what it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't found until years later you know, or yeah. really like documented and and brought into uh, brought to the forefront of people's. They of people's just minds. said that they believe it could be a meteorite, asteroid, or even a comet. Yeah, and they don't know, but they it was a no high clue. altitude explosion. It didn't even hit the ground. Uh, and it just flattened a ton of stuff. Yeah. And so those are all cosmic impacts, right? So we could get hit by an asteroid, and that could That's happen. Possible. That could happen at any point in time. Yeah. Because. Uh, 
they don't have a great way of monitoring for these these rocks because most of them none of them produce their own light so the only way that you can see it is when the sun is reflecting off of it right so that means so if you if you have the sun the earth and then space right if we're looking back towards the sun we can't see anything because the sun you know blocks it out and so we we only have 50% of the sky that we can observe right and of that 50% you got to think you know we're rotating and i mean it, it's very hard to track a lot of these objects in the movie don't look up is it an asteroid that hits that's Earth? yeah don't look up okay. is an asteroid is that predictive programming i think it was well and it goes into deep impact in armageddon and and the fact that you know they like to teach us in mainstream education that man you know what we had an extinction level event 65 million years ago that killed the dinosaurs but since then it's we've been good there's only been one extinction level event we well, you know we're good and what they're actually finding out and what Randall Carlson and some of these other researchers are I think discovering is that terrestrial impacts may be far more common than, than we've ever been able to to know. It might happen on a scale of one every hundred years or more, you know? Uh, and so it's just something to think about. That's just a possibility. Go ahead. Well, I don't know if you're getting to the prepping side of things yet. I just feel like if it is that level, if it is an extinction level event, there's not much to truly prep for. I'll get there. Okay. I'll get there. Okay. Okay, now the next is the EMP, so an electromagnetic pulse. This one has been on the forefront of, I think, a lot of people's minds, uh, especially recently. Um, but there is the event, if you look at the Carrington event, uh, it was a geomagnetic storm September 1st and 2nd of 1959. And the Wikipedia, whenever I was looking it up, really downplayed it. They were like, well, you know, it was kind of this cool thing. Like the telegraph, the people that were running the telegraphs in different places, they were able to turn off the batteries. And there was enough electrical charge in the system to where it powered their communications. They didn't have to have uh, any sort of uh, additional, you know, and then they they talk about some of the panels sparking and stuff. Uh, there's other accounts of entire portions of the infrastructure completely burning to the ground. The wires light on fire. The poles are gone, right? But in uh, in 1859, te uh, telegraphs and stuff was new. It was a new of it was a new thing. It was a new technology, so it wasn't ubiquitous with everything. And so if if a Carrington level event hit today, our entire grid would be decimated. All of our everything that re requires power, right? Well, and well, no, it's not everything. It's even cars, right? No. no? So this okay. is this is, and I'm about to get to this, but um, the Car so now, granted, take it with a grain of salt. I've been looking into this a little bit over the past little bit, and it's very difficult to get like a clear cut this would happen this these like what would be affected yeah these would be safe these but essentially what what it is is anything plugged into a large grid would, all be, would be affected by this i just thought for some reason that cars could be affected as well i'm getting there okay so um so it's basically a coronal mass ejection and then it's uh, ge geomagnetically, geomagnetically induced current is what happens whenever it hits the planet, right? So anything with a, a large circuit uh, catches it and and basically puts it through whatever whatever devices that we have. And so this is the reason I say that there's a difference. If it was a nuclear bomb, right? So if um, if Russia or China or whoever, or the United States government possibly, 
decides to blow up a warhead in, you know, upper level area. And they blow it up and the ground, and then the electromagnetic magnetic pulse, right? This, most radiation would make it to the ground. There, there would be very little fallout from a sort of attack like this. But the electromagnetic pulse would fry everything with a circuit board because it's a very short wave, very quick moving force that was produced really closely. The difference is a coronal mass ejection is a long wave, right? So typically the smaller circuit boards and the smaller circuits wouldn't catch it. It's, it's too, you, you'd have to have basically a wire over a very long period and that's what would catch that electromagnetic current. So that's what I'm saying that one of the things that's interesting about it is if it was a coronal mass ejection that hit the planet, there's a good possibility that all the vehicles would work, that your cell phone would maybe still work. Mm -hmm. It would just be anything that is plugged into the grid that can harvest that large yeah. wave would then be fried. So, you know. We don't know. Take that for what it is. Yeah, we don't know, really. Well, because we wouldn't know which one. It, it could be either one. It could be either one, but it – and it uh, – also, that's just people doing studies. I mean, yeah. uh, real, you know, closed – lab experiments are very different than real world events and so um you know just to just to put your mind at ease these things are not super common so similar events happened in uh, 1872 1921 uh, in march 1989 it knocked out huge uh power across quebec and in uh, 2012, July 23rd, a Carrington level event nearly missed the Earth. So, you know, it's not like it happens, uh, you know, every 30 years or so. Um, and so, it's good performance, babe. Yeah. So th uh, the that is a natural thing that happens. They have tree ring. They have all these different ways of measuring it. This has happened. Carrington level events have hit the planet many times in our history. Now, I'm still learning about a lot of this. So you say a natural occurring event, but those can also be from weapons, correct? So, yes. Uh, I mean, a coronal mass ejection is a natural occurring event. Okay. An EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, can be produced by multiple different things. Okay, that's what I was kind of Yeah, thinking. so, I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's natural, but then we also have the threat of an EMP from yeah. an unnatural nuclear bomb, if nuclear bombs are real. That's a whole nother thing. That's, a whole nother that's thing. another episode. Um, and so, so those are both, you know, and what is crazy to me, well, we'll talk about this here in a little bit. So, uh, other than now, there are countless other natural events that you have to be worried about, such as super volcanoes, which Yellowstone is a super volcano, tsunamis, just, just hur hurricanes, earthquakes, just tornadoes. a just a normal hurricane, right? Like yeah. Katrina, yeah. right? That was a that was a from all things I've heard, that was a apocalyptic event for people who lived yeah. through it. Like what was it called? Complete the uh, there was like a dome or like there was like a football stadium or something. They were like they were moving people into this place of refuge and then the power turned off. And they said it was it got wild. It yeah. got primitive. They had like, you know, gangs murdering people and uh you know uh, you know that scene in um what is it called? The games. Squid games? Squid games? Yeah. When they That's turned the power thinking, off, yeah. it was they said it was very similar to something like that happening. Um and so you've got natural events like that and then human caused events like war and looting and weather manipulation, which I think is probably a a real thing. I think that there's enough evidence we can go into that later or a different episode maybe, but there's a lot of evidence about uh you know cloud seeding uh, but also, you know, like harp and there's there's a bunch of different things where the weather could possibly be be manipulated by humans. And then, of course, the looming threat, which uh, predictive programming, right? The Terminator uh, is the, the rise of the AI 
and um, yeah, that's pretty creepy, right? Uh, where uh, the AI can become sentient, and it would be very similar to an electromagnetic pulse, where we wouldn't be able to use any of our electronics. The only problem with an AI apocalypse would be that the atro- the electronics would be able to use themselves. Did you see this as a tangent? But did you see that scientist who created an AI baby? No. Um, basically because it, that's still the biggest crux for these programmers is like babies, their minds, like their development, they're constantly intaking and learning themselves. And so there are things that you just don't even have to teach babies. They just learn. And we don't know how they learn. We don't know how they learn it. Whereas you can take a, a full grown robot basically and give it programs and it can perform these functions. But as of right now, they can't start out with, like, a baby and it teach itself how to do these things. So they, this one scientist, at least, I don't know how many people are on this team, created an AI child to try to mimic this idea of cognitive development where it develops itself. Which like, is well, not this seems terrifying at all. Safe. And then so, like, he has this, like, model of this child. <laughs> I don't know. Some things, I think, for me, are an unethical um yeah, it just gets a little blurry there. Oh yeah, no, that's all of that is is terrifying. Um, and so those are all my cases for like, you know that I I do feel like there is this stigma around prepping or yes. being prepared that of you can talk about that. Everyone's restroom. Okay, go to our restroom. Yes, I know. Okay. Um. Well, this kind of seems kind of funny because I feel like she almost needs to hear some of this. But let's see, where was I at? Um, she completely threw me off with that. I wasn't ready for it. Um, so what is the response is what I have written next. I can't remember what my um, – oh, oh, okay. I understand what I was going to say. So that is my case, right? So uh, a lot of people – I get this vibe from a lot of people where it's like, you know, and I actually, I go through this uh, definitely on a weekly basis where I start to think like, what is the likelihood that something like this is going to happen? It's so low. There's no chance that this is going to happen. Like the world is going to continue on as it has continued on. And we're going to, we're on a steady stream of progression and, you know, maybe these cataclysms happened in the past, but, you know, we're a different species almost now than than in the past. And so surely, surely this will not happen again. And if it did happen, well, you know, our society is so resilient that it would bounce back. The only thing, the only problem or the biggest problem with that is would our society bounce back? Is our society resilient? So we have... I think that that's the biggest, uh, not conflict, but like point of contention for conspiracy theorists is, do you think, do you think that an event will happen? And I feel like I have put forth a slight case that there is a decent chance, whether it's man-made or it's natural that an event is going to happen. Yeah, I think if you just, again, look throughout history, whether you're looking at war or natural occurring events, things happen. And that's not crazy to say. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's not out there. That is just pure fact that there are events, both naturally occurring and man-made, that jeopardize our existence as we know it. Right. So, yeah. Oh, good. Well, I guess I don't know what all you've said, but I think, I don't know. Continue on. We'll come back. Okay. Um, and so, so the first question is, okay, one of these events is highly likely to happen. You know, there, there's, there's a possibility. The next question is, what is the response? Right? So to circle back to what you were talking about earlier is like, okay, 
if something like this happens, what is the point of even trying to prepare for that eventuality, right? And I think, you know, this this gets a little bit into um, into some difficult territory that I don't think we have enough time to go into. But suffice it to say, humans have survived. Humanity has survived. Humans, yeah. yeah there there have guess... been – well, and I, I don't even know if I would say humanity has it, you know, because there's probably these dips where it's almost like Mad Max, right? Would you consider that humanity yeah. or humans? Still, I still can. I almost consider it humanity more than humans, which I don't know if that makes sense. But I think, in the event of one of these things happening, many, many people will die. Right. So it's not as though we are saving people's lives, but we can save the existence of humans on Earth. See, and I think that that's that's one of the things that uh, to to start to get a slight. So a lot of there, – there are degrees of preparedness, yes. right? And there are degrees of belief yes. in it, right? And it's one of the things that's always bothered me about like Christians, right, is if you genuinely believe what you are saying that you believe, then it should affect your life, yeah, right? And, and it should make your life look differently. So if you genuinely believe that the earth is going to end or like that there's going to be one of these events and your goal is to get through it, then you then you start to alter your life. Again, it depends. I think, again, it depends on what you're preparing for and then there's levels of preparedness. Because like with uh, an apocalyptic event, to truly survive whichever event it may be, the only way to do that might be if you have a bunker, and that's not accessible for many, many people. So again, there's layers to it, levels to it, to where the ultimate true prepared people have bunkers with a year's worth of food, with medication, radios, um, basically like blast from the past, like this level of preparedness right which again is not achievable for the average person and so and that's i think that's where i would that's what i would say is like so what is the response right is is there is there um benefit in acknowledging that this maybe will happen and saying well can i survive a zombie apocalypse probably not can I survive a hurricane? Probably yeah, yes. I think it's all risk assessment. And um, I don't know the word I'm trying to think of. But like weighing your risk versus reward, Reward, I guess. Yeah, of, okay, for me personally, if it, if it is an extinction level event and the only way for me to make it through that is is with an underground bunker knowing that everyone I know will be dead and that I will have to scavenge and whatnot. Okay, it's not worth it for me to try to prepare for that event. The lengths I would have to go to in order to truly be prepared outweigh what I feel comfortable doing now. So that one I'm going to say, if it's an extinction level event, I'm dead. I'm fine with that. But if we take it down a notch and say, okay, well, maybe not an extinction level event, but we are going to go into another world war and it will be economic collapse. I can say, okay, well, I may not need an underground bunker for that, but I might need food and weapons and safety. What does that look like? Can I meet that? Can I do those things while still maintaining my life, right? Yes, you can start to like level things out. Right. Especially then when it comes to, can I prepare for a tornado? Yes, right? Like many of us, especially if you live in like a tornado area, prepare for tornadoes. If you live in a hurricane area, you prepare for hurricanes. Or like a few years ago down here, it was before we got down here, but they had the snowmageddon. Yeah. Right? And Where so there are, they had rolling blackouts. There and, are people who still prepare for those things. Right. And that's not crazy. Like, again, that's on the low level of 
having extra water, having extra food, making sure you maybe have a heat source. But this is basing it off of your ability to prepare for the event, not necessarily the likelihood of the event happening. Well, yeah, because it's, again, to prepare for a tornado is much easier for me than to prepare for economic collapse. Right. So that one, it's like just working your way up the list. Right, right. It's like, okay, I can do that. So the way the way to prepare is to start with the daily things like what happens if my uh, tire goes flat. Exactly. Right, what happens if my battery dies. Or even like my dad would always say, make sure you have, especially in winter, a pair of gloves, a hat, and a coat in your car. Because what if your car dies and it is snowing outside and you're stuck for hours? So even just little things like that are prepping. Or well, like making sure you have water yeah. with you. Making sure you travel with snacks. Even. Yeah. And again, I think it, now if, if you go back to like snacks, I think of just moms. You don't leave the house with a baby without diapers, wipes, snacks, a bottle. Like you're going to be prepared because, you know, the likelihood of needing to take care of this baby is pretty high. Right. And you, like, those are things that are easy enough to put into a backpack and to take with you. Well, I'll say, too, um, if you go, like, on a, like, when we were rock climbing a bunch. Yeah. You, you start, you know, you go out one day where you're going to be away from the vehicle for 10 hours. And you start to think differently. You start yeah. to think, like, am I carrying enough water? Am I carrying enough food? Because you know, it one time you get stuck out there and you don't have enough water and you're like, dang, this really sucks, right? Yeah. It's almost like when you get caught with your pants down, that's when you are the most likely to prepare for the next. Well, that's what I was going to say too when I was looking up different prepping psychology things. Um, most people had an event that caused them to be a prepper. Some were personal as in... I read one of a guy who got into a motorcycle accident right before COVID happened. Then COVID happened, and he could not access the things that he needed because, one, he was still injured and couldn't ha – like, he didn't have full range of motion and mobility. He just couldn't go to the grocery store. Two, when he went to the grocery store, could send someone. They didn't have the supplies he needed. So he was just saying – after that, I learned to always stock up on these things because you don't know when you're going to need them and they may not have them when you need them. Oh, yeah, 100%. For others, for many others, they were just, hey, I grew up poor, and so now I stockpile things because I know what it's like to live in a house without food. So, But no matter what, most people had some event, even if it was just COVID itself, where it's like, wow, I realized how dependent I am on a grocery store. Well, and I one of the things I think is interesting is the people that are the most prepared, it's their lifestyle. Yeah. So, like, for instance, I think of there's a lot of people out here in the country uh, or in the rural areas that just have stuff because they're a welder. That's right? what I was going to say is I think when you get into the lifestyle shift, it switches from being a prepper to just being self-reliant. Because I think many people out here, just like you were getting at, they're not prepping. There are people who prep, but there are many people out here who would not consider themselves preppers. But living this lifestyle where you aren't close to a grocery store, you have a lot of animals or things or people dependent on you, you just tend to be more reliant on yourself. Yeah, you're. A, it's a lot less about, oh man, I don't have anything to eat. I'm just going to run to McDonald's real quick. Yeah. It's like, no, you need to make sure you have something to eat because – you're not just going to – well, I mean, maybe you're going to take an hour just to run to town and get um, a, meal. a meal and make it back home. But, but if you have horses and cows and goats and chickens and the power goes out, you need to make sure you can still – How are they getting water? Yeah, How or are if they it's, getting... everything's frozen, can you give them water? Can you feed them? So, again, it's just more of can I take care of myself and not rely on other things? I say things. Other structures to help me. Well, and, because uh, I think people help people. Like yeah. as oh, we yeah. saw with oh, this. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, shout out to uh, James, who's a listener of the podcast. Um, he, uh, you know, they're vegans, and so they converted most of their backyard into a garden. And it was like, well, that's what we eat, so we're gonna have to grow it, you know. And and so I do think like that's that's more of an ethical life decision. But 
even stuff like that, ethnic or ethical, <laughs> ethically, yeah. ethically, ethically, ethically. Yeah. Yeah. That's a word. Yeah. Okay. Ethically. So that can generate a lot of different stuff for you as well. You know, I know like the Mormons, the Mormon church, they, they, it's like a doctrine that you have three months of food. Yeah. That you I are. They, they're, I don't know why I don't, we don't have to get into Mormonism. But I have just heard that, that Mormons are kind of required to be preppers. Yeah, they, they are – it is uh, preached at, at the service that it's like, hey, guys, this thing is coming to an end. And when it does, we as a community have to be prepared because I think that's what's interesting is when you really start getting down the preparedness rabbit hole or mindset – it's very very quickly you realize like wow I have to have a community. Yeah, that's like you almost unless you have a ton of money and you have enough money to where you can build a bunker. Uh, I think of like Cloverfield Lane. Yeah, you remember that movie where he's down in this bunker and his entire plan was I'm not going to leave this bunker for three years. Right, which his, again is not accessible for most people. Yeah, his his entire well. Not only is it not accessible for most people, it's like most people have people to that they care about. Yeah. He didn't have anybody that he cared about. So he was able to say like, oh, no, the only point of this, which that's like my last point in this segment or this section is what is the point, right? What is the point of prepping? What is the point? What are you preparing for, right? To uh, Are you just preparing to – get a little bit further down the road before you die or are you trying to propagate? Well, and that's what I was going to say. I think that's where the divergence in preppers or the perception of preppers happens is I think there are the, what people consider the doomsday preppers who get a bad rap, who are people who have tons of guns, tons of ammo, tanks, maybe bunkers, the people who go all out preparing for these extinction level events but they are kind of, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to generalize to everybody, but many of them are just kind of thinking about themselves. Maybe their family, but that's about it. It's like, what do I need to it's just a, survive It's this an event? every man for themselves mentality. Yes. Whereas I think if you shift a little bit to many of the other preppers who are just temp- typically more self-reliant, it is a communal thing. It's okay if I want to be able to live my life, even in the event of a collapse or whatever else, Here's what I need to do, and here's what I need my community to do, because I can't do it alone. Again, unless I'm a billionaire or have tons of throwaway money, I cannot do these things alone. I can't produce enough stuff for everyone to survive. And even if you are, which, I mean, this gets into a completely different topic, but even if you are a billionaire, it's like, why are you keeping these billions? Like, what is the point of your accumulated wealth? You know, well, I'm sure like, all billionaires have bunkers. I mean, yeah, but I mean, like that's that's kind of the the big question is like, you know, okay, let's say that there is a big collapse and we make it through. Well, I would like there to be a few like little girls to also make it through, so that our little boys maybe can grow up and have like a woman to marry and have yeah. kids with. Like you know? if we're speaking about us specifically, am I just trying to just survive to where, yeah, we live and maybe my children make it and then they grow up alone and die because there's nobody else around who also made it. Right. Or are we trying to grow community that can survive and function as a community? Still? Right. And so, in, and I, I actually had this like, realization the other day about it because uh since i'm a snit you know i've got no ability to propagate the the species anymore right i'm i'm neutralized in that sense and it's kind of one of those (laughs) like john goodman in in cloverfield lane right what is the point of that guy surviving Right, it's just so that he can live a little bit, breathe a little bit more well, again, air. Again, this is where it comes back to humans versus humanity. Are you trying to simply just save a human, or are you trying to save humanity? Right. Whenever I was saying that earlier, I was I was mostly meaning like part of what I would define humanity as 
is the civilizing aspect of it, I right? Get it, yeah. But then you then you have the human animal, and on its own, it's you know not necessarily civilized. It's there's a lot. I of, don't think that humanity and civilization are synonymous, but that's just me. Okay, we'll continue. Okay. I mean, I, I think that gets down to a little bit more of a semantical, uh, you know, debate. And and so, now, to, to round the episode out, um, one, of, one of the things that I've been interested in and really came to, came to my, the forefront of my mind whenever I started thinking about, like, the Carrington-level event the super volcano event, the asteroidal impacts, right? I think that there's common knowledge that they disseminate into humanity. And then there's like the actual knowledge that probably these elite individuals and high level government officials are prompted with, right? And so it's kind of like one of those things where they'll say, like in uh, Don't Look Up, right? They're telling the public, no, 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 there's nothing to see here. There's no danger. Nothing's happening. There's no, you know, there's no cataclysm in the, because they didn't want them to riot. I mean, yeah, the scientists were trying to tell The people. scientists yeah. are saying, no, 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 it's for sure. Like, this is, yeah. we've got evidence that this, wasn't but the media is like, no, 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 let's not worry about that. Like, it's probably just going to miss us. It's probably this and that. And it's, it's this idea that. They are playing, and they're they're playing a different game. Well, I also think that it's just this mindset of not being able to view our life as something different than it is now. And so I think every day we do that, and I think even with COVID, that was a wake-up call for many people of, it can't ever happen. Like, the odds are so low. It'll never affect me. And there's such a... What's that like a bias? I don't know. I feel like there's probably a like confirmation actual... bias almost. Like yeah. or like uh, it's almost like, like it's... an amp- am- anthropomorphized view of reality. I was gonna say sense. I thought it was maybe called like normalcy bias. Normalcy bias. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that is yeah to yeah, minimize normal. threat warnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because again, like I have lived a very comfortable life. I've never been starving. I've never needed for much. I've always been taken care of. I've never lived through. I mean, unless, like, there's 9-11, there's COVID, there's things like that. But, like, I've never lived through a huge event to where I believe that those can happen, right? Like, so I can see how my generation especially would downplay anything because it doesn't seem believable because it's never affected me. And so there is a tendency to downplay anything because it, well, it hasn't happened, therefore it won't happen, which just isn't true. Right. And it's like you have to make sure you're always checking yourself. Well, and so I guess to to really get into this topic, um, I'm wondering if it's an engineered collapse. Because if if you re- – once you start to get into the preparedness mindset and the preparedness culture, you start to see all of these vulnerabilities – yeah. Right. You so you start to well, like they, you start to look at it and you're like, wait a second. Our our electric grid is how vulnerable, well, and it's vulnerable to something that we know for a fact happens on a repeatable natural right. And so, like for instance, if if the government or power companies or whoever had have built everything underground. If they put transformers underground, if they had a, if they had to put shielding, the arresters, there are things that they could have done to harden the electrical system. That with one of these events that will happen, they know one of these events will happen. Or also, the possibility, right? They knew about that nuclear bombs produce electromagnetic pulses from the second that they started doing experiments on them. They said, "What? Well, wow." Our largest enemy in the world has nuclear weapons, and the nuclear weapon just so happens to put out an electromagnetic pulse. But let's just go ahead and build a super soft target of our electrical grid. Our electrical grid is a soft target. Our bridges, right, that just randomly get hit by barges. 
it's a soft target. It is easy to, it's not resilient. It's not hardened, right? If, um, go ahead, you're shaking your, oh, like, like for instance, one thing is our water system. If power goes out, our water system is shut down. It is gone, right? Our sewage, everything is built with a very specific linchpin of having to have power. And instead of creating a decentralized power grid, right? Like let's even say they, they build the conventional power grid, but instead of connecting it all together, and making it to where one event that hits one part of it is going to take out a completely unaffected area. I, I was just talking to my dad. He came through town, and, and one of the things that he was talking about was that this huge solar farm in Texas got hit with a hailstorm, and it obliterated all of the solar panels because it was this huge, huge uh, hailstorm. And so they had, they had centralized all of these panels into one area to the point where one natural event could completely disable the entire thing, right? It seems the same thing with our financial system. It's all centralized, controlled. It's all central planning. It's all everything. It's like if you were going to design a system to be resilient, they did the opposite. They designed it to be weak and soft and it was all designed it was it's not like we just inherited something and it's like well you know it just has to be this way physics dictates that um you know that grid systems have to be vulnerable like this go ahead say what you're gonna say because you're throwing I a little disagree with most what you're, you're, saying, you're so. throwing a little fit over yeah here. i don't i think you're looking at it in way too simple of terms well, if they knew what was coming, they should have just done everything to prevent it. Cover Not prevent all it. Of our bases. Not prevent it. I'm saying if you, they are you already have... going to secure everything, then why not go ahead and prevent it? No, I'm saying you're not preventing it. <laughs> right? These are unpreventable I know. things. But yes, you're saying why don't we protect ourselves? Why don't we cover all of our bases? No. Protect our water, protect our energy, no. protect, protect I'm not even saying that. I'm saying yes. I'm saying in that the same exactly in the saying. same way that I was approaching preparedness for a person, right? In a person, I'm saying there is no way that you can prepare for all eventualities. Exactly. Right? But it would be like Oh, it's it's negative thirty degrees outside, and I'm about to go get in my car. How about I don't even wear a jacket to my car? I'm just running in my car. And many people don't. Well, that's what I'm saying, though. That's my point. Many people are stupid and yes. don't they don't invest billions of dollars. Like all of the stuff that I'm talking about is billions of dollars. How invested. prepared are you right now? Um, not as prepared as I would like to be. Why not? If you know all of these things, why is our water not secure, our electricity not secure, our food supply not on lock? Like, why? Uh, well, because I'm a 35-year-old person who has been doing this, who is – I mean, that the reason that we're at the farm, the reason we are at the farm is because of COVID. Because I realized – You're not answering my question. We, why am I not doing it? Why are you not fully prepared? Because of my personal limitations. Which is? Money, okay. Time, okay. Capacity. Oh, interesting. What does the United States government not have limits of? Time. Look, look money, up how, how look up how much capacity. money. Look up. I'm sure that this statistic exists. Look up how much money it would cost to harden our electric grid. Let's see that. I mean, again, well, let me hold on before I even do that. It comes back to cost analysis. No risk analysis. Yes. Yes, risk analysis. Risk analysis. If this one thing. If this one thing fails, mil they say if an electromagnetic pulse hits North America, 90% of our population would be dead within three months. Now, this might sound cruel. That's the me. government. Can, you, can I speak? That's the government assessment may from I speak 20 years on ago. On this topic. Yes. You may disagree with me on this, and maybe many people disagree with me on this. I think it comes back to the human versus humanity debate. I don't think the government cares if 90% of people die. Yes, 
I agree with you. So I don't think they are going to shovel billions of dollars into the electric grid when they don't care about the average person. That's what I'm saying. That, that, okay. I'm saying it's an engineered collapse. Right, no, I'm saying no, that they no. don't care if 90% of the population I dies. I think those are two different things, though. Hold on. Let me clarify. Let me clarify. I think there's a difference in saying, look, we are going to invest time and energy to a certain extent into the public. Now, outside of a major event happening, we are good to go. And that's exactly what they've done. They have but that's said, not true. Yes. They, they have, have rolling blackouts currently in the Texas Panhandle. Okay. New York City, almost okay. almost every other year they get hit with a heat wave where they have to shut down the power. Let me I'm just saying continue. it's not even an adequate power system. Okay, that's, that's fair, but let me continue. I think there's a difference between saying I'm going to set up a system which is not the best system, but it is adequate enough. Now, I'm not going to argue adequate enough when what that means. I'm just saying that's what I think the government has done currently. Versus, I'm going to design a system that is set to fail because I'm hoping 90% of the population dies. Okay. I think those are two different things, and I am for option A. Like, I think option A is what it is. Because, again, of just risk assessment and what the government's priorities are. Okay, now, let's say, let's say, you know, this last year, I've been buying a Gucci uh, Prada shoes. Okay. Right? I've been buying all of this brand new fancy shit that only looks good on the red carpet. Yes. Even though I know, right? So I'm saying, so listen, listen, listen. I'm saying that my limiting factor, the reason that I'm not prepared, is because I don't have the money. Hold on. But then I'm turning around and I'm spending the money that I do have on shit that is not going to benefit me. Okay. With that in mind, we just painted our house. Yeah, you. Yes. I mean, I painted it. I know. But you were the one. Like, uh, there is a lot of stuff. Because, again, can I come back to my risk assessment here? I could... I could literally live in this house and never have spent a dime on it. And the house would be functional. And then I could say, we are going to take every penny we earn and stockpile. But your 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 no, hypothetical no, uh, is uh, not... Uh, 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 I'm not done yet. But I don't do that. We don't do that. It's not as though you save every penny. You just bought two new pairs of shoes within the past month. Off of Poshmark. Okay, but they still cost money, right? Super discounted, yes. <laughs> I'm just saying. And I need shoes. I do you? Or I do need you? no. I need. I'm not. I didn't go buy Gucci and Gabbana bullshit. You bought those Merrill Croc looking things. Did you yeah. Need, did you need those? I did need those, and they were really cheap. I'm just saying, we are all buying things. We're all making trade offs. So I am saying, but uh, 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 let me finish. You're, let you're, me finish. You're hypo- okay, finish your hypothetical. That's not true. It is. I mean, it's it not. Is true for us. Here's what I'm. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. You are right. I, okay, let's say that the government takes like a, a port. They're 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 out of money. They're out of money. We don't got no money to go anywhere, and so we're portioning our money, and we're just. We're just getting by where we can because we don't have any money, really. Like, our greatest, my greatest limiting factor, let's go back to what I said, is time and money. Mm-hmm. Their greatest limiting factor is not time or money, it's intention. Theirs is intent. And That's what I said. Look it up. Priorities. Look it up. How okay. much it, how much would it cost? How much would it cost to harden the electric grid in America. This is my point. How much would it cost to build a uh, a barrier in front of a, a bridge to a major port? Again, again, hold on. You, you keep... Here, I'm going to go turn off the... Okay, I was going to say, you keep making a lot of fallacies. Um, right now it would, this is to make a functional smart grid, basically to update what we have into a smart grid, 338 billion to 460, 476 billion. Okay. So say that, say that again. 338 to 476 billion. Okay. 4, 
Seventy six. The the highest was four seventy six billion. Okay, how much money have we sent to an aid in, to Ukraine? Those are fallacies. No, it's not a fallacy. They are fallacies. No, it's not a fallacy. The argument was that they were operating out of a limitation because they, they did not are. have the money to do it. They didn't have the money to do it. Yeah. I'm saying they've got money. They've got the money. And now, if you're looking, if you're looking at it, and you're saying. Well, what is the possibility of this failing? And if this they one, they sent seventy-five billion. They've sent seventy-five billion, and then to Israel. I'm just saying that these are fallacies. It's not you're not equating things correctly. And this is not to mention the money that they already allocate to infrastructure and to fixing stuff. I'm saying I think that it's a engineered collapse. In the sense that they are the government. It, I, this is tricky. Maybe fourteen billion. I can't. I'm. I'm not doing it hard research to be able to tell exactly. What. And that's within the last year. But I think it's more than that. I think. I mean, that's I think what your numbers. I bet you got those from the Associated Press. Uh no, I'm looking at multiple headlines. But okay, and yes, I'm not. I have not done a deep dive on this because I've literally looked up in about thirty seconds. Right. But what I'm saying. What I'm saying is. What I'm saying is it, it's it's one thing to be saying like we're we're balancing all of these different things, right? And, and but they you, are balancing you know you know that they're building underground bunkers. There is no doubt that they have huge underground bunkers. I believe that. There's I mean, no they, I mean, doubt proven. Yeah, there's no doubt that they have infrastructure in place for doomsdays. Yeah. There's no doubt that they think it's coming. There's okay. no doubt that they think it's coming. Okay. But they're not they are not willing to upgrade the certain things that would propagate the ability for individuals to survive through it. Yeah. Which they're stealing our money. You, okay. <laughs> they're stealing our money to build You keep taking a topic just going bam. I'm with you to a certain extent. That yes, they are not taking bill the Four hundred seventy-six billion to upgrade our electric grid. I think that it's a fallacy to say, "Well, they obviously have the money because they sent it to Ukraine." Those are fallacies. how's that a fallacy? Because they did it. Yes, I know. It's not a fallacy to say that they had. You said you said that the equivalent was the reason that I am unprepared is the same reason that the United States government is unprepared. No, and I'm saying that is not you're true. Not, you're not letting me speak. Because the reasons that I am unprepared is because we we're trying to get the money together, we're trying to get the time together, and there are other things that you're right. I mean, it is a cost, right? It's like the world ends, is it going to benefit us that our house is painted a slightly different color and it's slightly more curb appealing? It's not going to benefit us at all. But if the world doesn't end, well, every time we pull up the driveway and the house looks a little bit nicer, that is going to benefit me. Okay. So there is a benefit. It's not like there is no benefit to what we're doing. Do you want me to say something? Yes. Okay. The house being painted was just one example. But there are many, many more. Even taking into consideration um, the yeah. food that we buy. Hold on. We spend more money on groceries than we probably have to. I can go buy really cheap food and get by. I don't. We tend to buy healthy food that costs more money, and we tend to prioritize our health, which is, as of right now, a more pressing issue. Now, if an event happens, obviously, the latter is more pressing. But I am willing to spend more money up front on food because we need it now. I spend money on vitamins and supplements. Because that's something I see that we need now. I spend money on new coats because that's something we need now. We probably have to buy a new car coming up pretty soon. Because that's something that's going to be pressing at when that happens. Um, I can go through a list of 50. You're arguing with a fallacy. Can, can I finish before you jump in? Because I don't think that I am. Okay. I'm simply saying we have X amount of money. And if we just focused, just focused on prepping we could probably afford to do quite a bit of prepping right like we could probably uh definitely harden our electric system figure out a water supply i mean we could do a lot of things 
but we can't. Because? Because we have other things that need our attention now. Oh, other priorities. Yes, and I'm agreeing with – I like, that is exactly my point, is that the government has other priorities. They see certain but, but what things I'm, but, as more pressing. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that doesn't mean that they're hoping we hold up, die. hold up, hold up. If we did not have a car, it would greatly inhibit our ability to prep. Correct? No. Okay, you could get to work without a car. I mean, you could get a paycheck without a car. I can probably get by with a lot of things. No, no. What I'm saying is. We have certain things that we have got to do to function, period. Huh, interesting. I'm yeah. saying the government does not have those same things. They don't have to do anything to function? No, they, they can do. Just throw they throw all of their money into the electric grid? I'm not, the, I'm not even saying throw all of our money into the electric grid. I'm saying that there are steps. They, there are a lot. That, that was the smart uh upgrades to the to the electrical grid there are ways that they could upgrade the electrical grid okay. without it being like so it, hold on. it's i'm not saying Question. i'm not saying we have to completely revamp everything but they could say okay these like this is strategic this is question? strategic thinking right you, and you're right you do not think strategically about most things most things you do not think strategically about you think emotionally about them and there's nothing wrong As with do that. most humans. Okay, okay. Acknowledge that. But what I'm saying is a system like the uh, UN, United States military is not supposed to think emotionally. Okay, they are I supposed agree to think that. tactically. And they're not the ones. The United money States all over the place. government is not supposed to think emotionally. I don't think, they're I think supposed they to think thinking tactically. They are. Th no, they are not thinking tactically. If they were thinking tactically, what well, unless it may not be the unless you like. yeah, if they're trying to engineer a collapse, then you are correct. Okay, they question, are making though. good tactical decisions to collapse the country, may and I, that is what my argument is. Can I ask a question? Yes. So let's just say that they pay the four hundred seventy-six billion to update the entire grid, so our grid is ready to go, and then we get bombed. What happens after that? What are you talking about? Well, I'm just saying, like, okay, so they could make our electric grid as updated as possible, and then we just get bombed. So the billions of dollars that they spent is now wasted? Well, no, I'm just saying, or, or super volcano happens, or what you're saying is what you're what what you're saying is the money, everything. the money that there's. Well, if we got a run of tornadoes coming, if they prepared for that properly. That's what I'm saying is right now all of our power is centralized. Yes, I get that. But that's my point is, okay, so you could spend that much money on the grids. But really then to now make everyone say, okay, if you were to give – if you were to prepare for tornadoes, you should probably have bunkers in place for people to access. Hmm. Okay, so then go and build that. Well, within those bunkers, you probably need some sort of food. Go and add that. But what I'm now, saying, what about some what, sort what I'm of like water what, supply? What you're saying, go and fix that. What you're saying is, it would be out of the way. You're saying it would be out of the way. What I'm saying is, they built all of these systems from the ground up with the knowledge of the vulnerabilities that they were building into them. Yeah. We live in a mobile home, and we know that we get tornadoes. Why? Why do we build mobile homes? Because we're limited. Exactly. The United States government is not limited. I think they're limited. You're, no, they are not. They're spending trillions of dollars. Yep. They do. They make whatever happen, happen. That they want to have happen. Okay, let me just say this. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, to me, you're projecting onto a system human characteristics. They're and I'm saying, humans. I'm saying that they, that the, the high level elites are not humans. They are not humans. They're lizard people. Well, or vampires. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, like, you could not be that level and claim to be a human. It's the same thing as being like a Christian. They have the same faults. Yeah, you, you can't, you, you, can't claim, you can't claim you can't claim to be a Christian, but then be a serial killer, right? It's it's two contradictory um, ideologies, right? And that's what I'm saying is they are not human, right? You made the claim yourself. If they were human, then they would be thinking like, hmm, 
So you're saying with a few tweaks, we could maybe instead of losing 90% of our uh, electorate, the people who vote for us, the people who give us this money that we are then squandering uh, with with some tweaks, we could and instead of losing 90%, we could only lose like 20%. If they were thinking emotionally, they would say, well, yeah, let's make those tweaks. Let's spend the oh, money where we need to spend the money. Let me let me um, clarify. I think you and I are saying the same thing up to an extent. I agree that the United States government is thinking tactically in those tactics. On how they can kill the most people. Well, no, no, that's where we disagree. I think those tactics are not prioritizing the average American person. You think that is designed strategically in order to hurt 90% of the American public. I think that is just a product of the system that they have put in place. So that is a part of their risk analysis. They have decided this is the most amount of money we will give to this currently and so we can handle these other things and then we might come back to it. I think at this point we're just going in circles. I would love to hear what other people think. So people who listen to this, I would like to see if they agree more with you or if they agree more with me. And, and so – so you're 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 just saying that they're ambivalent and they just can't afford it. No, that's not what I'm saying. You're saying that their limitations are the same limitations that I have. Which is which I, is I think that they are limited by time and money, yes. And that their priority is not the survival of every single American citizen. That doesn't mean I think that they're designing a system to kill people. That means I think that they understand that people might die and they are willing to accept that as part of the risk analysis. Okay. Maybe so. I mean, that's just me. You don't have to agree with me. I just think I think my my argument's more sound, but that's just me. I know. Well, that's I had a question mark. Is it an engineered collapse? And And we are free to disagree on this. We are free to I don't think it is. We are free to disagree. Um and so I would love to uh, to read some comments and see what people think about okay. that disagreement and see if see if just objectively looking at the evidence if it shows um, see because a lot of people have made that argument and it's a common argument against conspiracy theories as they say it's the government there's no way that they could be that compartmentalized or that controlled or that uh far thinking right like it's just a bunch of people and a bunch of departments there's no way that they could plan this huge let me just be clear i'm not saying that that's that is analogous to what you're saying no it's not but okay it is analogous you're, i'm you're, not saying that they are not you're saying doing you're it. saying that if a report gets dropped on your table which a report did come out like over 20 years ago, I believe Obama and Trump both stated that they wanted to harden the, the grid. It's a known problem that has been very well flushed out and very – on the. it's not – time is not a limiting factor for them because they've had time. They've okay, had, they've had probably offer? 50 years of knowing that our system was – needed to be held to a higher standard and needed to be better engineered. They knew – that it needed that. Um, and they spent the money on a system that still had the same vulnerabilities, even though they knew that the vulnerabilities existed. Even though if that were completely – if you built the most impressive electric grid, there are still vulnerabilities, correct? I mean in any system – A bridge could still collapse. In any system, there are vulnerabilities. Okay. But there so that, are – there are a way of – there is a way of increasing vulnerabilities – or limiting vulnerability. Okay, I'm just simply saying that it's not as though if the government did this, we are the most protected we could possibly be. It simply protects us in this one area, which is good, and I think that that is a great thing to aspire to. We are still vulnerable. Well, what your your argument was, your argument earlier where you said you said well they could spend all this money and the system could still fail. Yeah. They've spent all this money. Yeah. On a system that will a hundred percent fail. It's it's like I agree with you. Like, let's not make bad investments, right? You the, people should be saying like, "Hey, we need to question whether this is a good investment or a bad investment." But they've continually selected the bad investment. 
they've continually selected they've continually selected the system that will not create any resilience and i'm saying when you when you look at it over a long period of time and they systematically select the most vulnerable option every time to me that seems like it, where it's it's like it's like hey you know you can buy this car and if you're in a car wreck, you have a 90% chance of, of living. Or for $100 less, you can have this other car, and it's a 90% chance you're going to die. And people and, still choose the second car all the time. No, that's not true. Yeah. Or, or okay, would I choose that second car? Probably not. When, why? Why? Because I've seen dead bodies in cars. Yeah, I'm just saying that, I mean... That's what I'm saying. Z, Z, even when presented with those statistics, there are still people who choose option B. Why should it even be an option? That's the other question. I feel like now you're going on a completely different... I mean, it is a slightly... It, that, And, you know, we can, we can wrap it up. But, I mean, to me, it's it's just interesting, right? It's like, it's like, hey, you know, we could build... We could build this bridge to not collapse. When was that bridge built? Um, so you can make the argument that it's over 60 years built and the barges that they have now are way bigger. And I mean, that's that's a valid argument. In, in the 70s, 1977. Okay, 77. Um, what's, the, what's the oldest bridge in the in world? In America? Oh. Let's just say in the world. Uh, oldest long span, maybe. I, I don't know. Hey, you know, I'm, I mean, like a real bridge. There are several of them that are popping up. It, which one is the oldest? I'm not. Without nah, let's not further. go the oldest. Let's just go old. Okay. Um, let me just see here. There is one. The bridge over River Mills. Caravan Bridge in Turkey, 850 B.C. B.C.? Before Christ? Okay. We're talking about an almost 3,000-year-old bridge? And your point? My br my point is, you can't build a bridge Was it hit with a boat? Did it have the possibility of being hit with a boat? Uh, no, it's over a tiny you know, river. You know that the you know that the uh, twin I'm towers. Sure a tornado came along. The and twin towers over were engineered to be struck by planes. Okay. And then they were struck by planes. Yeah. And they didn't fall down. Okay. Until. I'm. We're not getting into that. But you know what I'm saying. No. I mean, it, what I'm saying is, if it is a possibility, if it is something to consider, then you should consider it. Yeah. If I'm, you're building a bridge over one of the most trafficked ports in America, even in the 70s, right? It was probably the most trafficked bridge even in the 70s. Why would you not think, you know what? There is a possibility with the tides, with the wind, that one of these boats could hit this bridge. And like, should we maybe put a guardrail in? But you're saying since the 70s, no other uh, boat has hit the bridge yet. It's a very anomalous circumstance. I'm just saying, and what I've discussed this with you already, it's the same way that there are not stoplights at intersections until there needs to be a stoplight at an intersection. I mean... I bet the next time they build that bridge, they're going to put in extra supports. I don't know. I just, I mean, that, it, it kind of, the, the main reason that I put that portion into this, this podcast is for the, um, should you prepare circumstance, right? It's to me, to me, it elevates the likelihood that a, that a, something is going to fail if you know that the people and the organizations that are responsible for making sure that a system does not fail, which is what I would say the institutions of government should be, um, 
have maybe not only been asleep at the wheel, but maybe steering at the, you know, like not only is the boat going in an iceberg filled sea, but maybe the captain is steering us to the ice. We're not going into Titanic conspiracy theories. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> there were like, or there's a torpedo that Hold on. hits the boat. What was I going to say? You guys threw me off. God damn it. I just had something. You just won't stop talking sometimes. Sorry. Okay. Yes. I think this is something we can agree on. Whether or not you think the government is intentionally trying to kill people or they just have other priorities, it is good to be self-reliant. Because I do think that even if you believe what I believe, that the government is prioritizing certain things, and maybe my personal safety is not their top priority, I should not be solely reliant on the government. Right? Like, um, I should not be solely reliant on institutions to save me. Right. Because at the end of the day, they have other priorities that are not my safety. Right. So, again, whether or not that's – whether or not there's something more um, nefarious. nefarious behind it, my safety is my responsibility. Now, with that being said, I only have certain measures I can take. But I do think it's a good idea to take certain measures. Right? Like Again, like you mentioned, that's why we moved down here. That's why we have a garden. That's why we have chickens. That's why we are working toward becoming more self-reliant. Because no matter what anybody says about government or whatnot, my safety is no one's responsibility but me. And so I need to be in charge of that. Although they take money out of your check. They sure do. That's why I have a road I can drive on. Mm, we're going we're gonna to end it there. <laughs> I'm just saying. There were roads before there was taxes. Just anyway, as a side note. All I'm saying is, and I, again, I don't, I don't love getting taxed. I'm not saying that taxes are great. I'm just saying there are benefits. Oh, we're not going to go into all that. Get to drive on a shitty road that always has potholes. Anyway, congratulations. Taxes. Your safety is your responsibility, and with that being said, you will never be fully prepared. Right. Yes. So that's kind of my point. Uh, there are certain measures I'm willing to take. Unless certain, you're a uh, governmental elite or a billionaire. There are certain in which measures case, I'm not willing to take. And I know that that leaves blind spots. And again, I also want to acknowledge that even if I were 100% as prepared as could possibly be, I still have weak spots. Like, no, I feel like there's there is always room. Uh, well, like, for I always, that's one of the things I always laugh about, like, a lot of guys who get all tactical, tactical, they get all their tactical shit, and then they're like, they're fat. And you're like, bro, you're going to roll an ankle. Like, what do you, you know, like, or, you know, they, they got all of this stuff that is going to make them prepared. But, you know, at the end of the day, there was a show called um, Alone, I think. Where contestants were dropped off in the middle of nowhere, and there was a so there's two contestants dropped off, and whoever stayed out there longer got the money or something, you know, oh, something yeah. like that. And this girl was like killing it. She built her, she built her, uh, shelter. She had all, she had all this stuff prepared. I mean, she was like dialed in, and then she was like ripping little boards for Tinder. So that whenever she goes to start her fire, she already had a fire going. But if her fire went out, she wanted a backup supply of to restart it. And so she's like, you know, nicking these things down. And her she has a slip of hand and her hatchet hits her on the wrist and like slices her hand open. And she has to quit. And she's like a week and a half into it. You know, she was anywhere close to winning. But. She was so prepared, and she was doing all this you stuff, all and then the right she just had still. this, you know, this little mess up, and she's out, you know. Yeah. And so I do think that that's probably the case, uh, which it will be probably even like, you know, I don't even think like we – I don't have a delusion that we would somehow be the lucky ones. But it's like if, if everybody – if everybody's preparing, then there will be the lucky ones. Yeah, I think I do think it's silly to it not have some the, level. It increases the likelihood preparedness. Yeah, 
if you are solely reliant on an entire system, it would be smart to have a few things to make sure that if the electricity went out, you're not dead in three days. Right. You know, like that's that would be, I think, good for anybody to prepare for. Just basic safety. The same way, again, that if you were to drive down the road, it's a good idea to at least have a few things with you so that you're not just stranded. Right. right? It's the same reason they say if you go for a run, tell someone. Yeah, redundant systems. Yeah, so I do think prepping is good as long as you don't just... I think the only time it crosses a line is when you do get those people who are... I think hoping for collapse just so that they can use guns. I think that's what scares people when people think of preppers as like nut jobs. I think that's right. what it is. Right. But. Well, all right. Well, hopefully, uh, I'm not exactly sure where we ended up on that, but hopefully you, took us there. Hopefully you buy a, a bag of beans and a bag of rice the next time you go to the store and figure out a way of storing it. And let so. me know who won the argument. Yeah, yeah, well, that's that's a big question. We'll see who wins. All right, thank y'all for listening. Until next time, peace.